think back to the last time you had a cold and you went to the doctors and you left the doctors not getting a script for anything you didn't feel that great about that doctor right you feel like hey i just paid some money to see you and you didn't give me any drugs to help me feel better a cough or a sore throat 70 to 80 percent of the time is caused by viruses so if you go to a doctor and they give you an antibiotic they're actually contributing to the problem unless they understand a bit more about your patient history superbugs are bugs that are impossible to kill and we are usually in the role of trying to kill those superbugs because they are affecting our body and making us sick. Let's say you have surgery, your surgeon cuts the skin open and you bandage it up, but that wound then becomes infected by a drug resistant bacteria that no matter what antibiotics we can give to kill that bacteria, it stays alive and that wound gets infected and your arm falls off and all sorts of terrible things happen and that bacteria can spread in the community and cause all sorts of havoc. To understand how bacteria actually became resistant to antibiotics in the first place, it became superbugs. This is at its core a story story about adaptation. If you expose a population of bacteria to a very toxic chemical, an antibiotic that's designed to kill them, there could be out of a million bacteria, maybe 20 of them are naturally resistant. And all of a sudden, after that danger of the antibiotic goes away, there are still 20 bacteria left over. And those 20 are the strongest within that community. And the thing about bacteria is that they have only one agenda and that is to replicate and survive for another day, keep growing and dividing and dividing. And they grow really, really quickly. Some species such as E. coli can replicate as quickly as every 20 minutes. And one bacteria can become 68 billion bacteria in 12 hours. When you replicate so fast, copying DNA is not an error-proof process. All of those mutations in the DNA could lead to many different directions. Could be a bad mutation that then kills the bacteria, or it could lend itself to a positive new superpower when a catalytic event comes along trying to kill all the bacteria all of these different mutations, all of these superpowers come to the forefront and the best gets chosen to survive to see another day. Once the bacteria have found the magic source, have found a gene that's got a mutation that allows it to survive for a little bit longer, bacteria very freely pass genetic material between each other. They share the goodies. One bacterial cell that has a gene that's resistant can very easily pass that gene to another bacterial cell. It doesn't have to be the same species of bacteria, it can be other species of bacteria. And all of a sudden that antibiotic no longer kills anything because the bacteria has been very dutifully passing on its secret this gene to all the different bacteria that comes into its immediate orbit. Bacteria can either prevent the antibiotic from ever getting inside the cell by keeping it out, making the cell wall thicker so the antibiotics can't come in. Even if the antibiotic does get in, it can push it back out through different pumps, efflux pumps. It could also have a slightly different version of the molecule that the antibiotic is supposed to bind to. And if it can't bind to it that tightly, the antibiotic kind of falls off and the bacteria is able to swim away and live another day. And the last way that bacteria can avoid being killed by antibiotics is to make a chemical that just goes out there and cuts that antibiotic in half. And the most famous example of this is beta-lactamases. These are enzymes made by bacteria that specifically bind to antibiotics that have a beta-lactam ring, which is a chemical structure found in many of the penicillins, the most common, the earliest antibiotics that we know of. And these beta-lactamase enzymes made by the bacteria go out there and bind to the beta-lactam antibiotics and chop it in half or make it inactive before they have a chance to come into close vicinity of the bacteria. All of this replication, all of this evolution, all of this pressure to change over time is what gives bacteria the ability to survive in radioactive wastelands, as well as to survive in hospitals, even though we're cleaning things down all the time and giving these vulnerable patients all of these antibiotics. It's not just a biological problem. It's also a social problem, a communication problem in many ways, because we are making the problem worse by giving antibiotics out too frequently. This population of very different bacteria with all of their different genes and mutations, there's no need for the super resistant superbug to be the dominant face of that bacterial community if the antibiotic wasn't introduced in the first place, right? If all of a sudden they weren't the one with the huge advantage of being able to live in the presence of this chemical, they will not become the dominant species. They will not be passing that gene around. So really we need to be using antibiotics very sparingly, but just think back to the last time you had a cold and you went to the doctors and you left the doctors not getting a script for anything, not getting an antibiotic because you were told a cough or a sore throat, 70 to 80% of the time is caused by viruses. So if you go to a doctor and they give you an antibiotic, they're actually contributing to the problem unless they understand a bit more about your patient history. Let's say you've been sick for a couple of weeks now. That 
likelihood of you still being infected by a virus is quite a bit lower. The odds of it being bacterial are a little bit higher, not to mention you may have contracted a secondary infection from a bacteria after the virus caused the initial infection. If you left that initial consult with the doctor, not with any medication, and you just told, look, it's going to get better over time, you didn't feel that great about that doctor, right? You feel like, hey, I just paid some money to see you and you didn't give me any drugs to help me feel better. That puts a little bit of pressure on these practitioners to give you medication. In Australia, we're seeing a really interesting test case of how antibiotics can be prescribed or should be prescribed. UTIs, or urinary tract infections, affect half of Australian women. Pharmacy treatment could soon be an option. A parliamentary committee in Australia spent nine months investigating UTIs and the treatments, recommending ultimately that pharmacists be given the power to prescribe antibiotics for UTIs instead of waiting a long time to see a doctor, to see a general practitioner, to only then receive the same drug you could have received from the pharmacist maybe two weeks earlier. This article really highlights the empowerment of pharmacists as healthcare professionals because they believe they can't give a great treatment or management plan without referring them to a GP under the current prescribing rules and there are a lot of patients who are suffering who are waiting a long time with this very painful urinary tract infection it hurts every time you need to do a wee there's constant burning sensation often it keeps coming back as well after the first treatment so you don't want to go see a doctor and then it comes back you have to line up again to go see a doctor this recommendation in South Australia basically says pharmacists should be able to prescribe these antibiotics to women doctors in Australia and the pharmacists they're in the middle of a turf war. They can't really agree on what's the best practice. Doctors will say, no, 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 pharmacists can't do it. Only doctors can do it with all the full medical history. Pharmacist says, look, we got to treat the patient first and put the patient first and we can get the medication to them more quickly. What's the harm? Both sides, doctors and pharmacists are accusing each other of financial motives. Hey, we can make more money from seeing the patients or prescribing antibiotics earlier. The human problem makes this a more difficult solution. You can see this is quite a complicated problem that we have on our hands and it's not going to go away anytime soon. As the bacteria gets exposed to the same antibiotic again and again, natural selection will make it so that the superbug with the gene that is best optimized to survive then becomes a dominant face of that bacterial community, then spreads that gene anywhere it can see fit. There are first line antibiotics that you can get a lot more easily at the pharmacy. The resistance to those will become more widespread and now we'll have to roll out these second line or last line antibiotics that we usually reserve for very, very severe infections. We have to use them more routinely and they then become more resistant or more resistance becomes developed against them. And we're going to run out of antibiotics because discovering antibiotics is a very tricky proposition. Is there anything we can do to prevent antibiotic resistance? We can raise awareness that many infections will get better by themselves, monitor the infections due to resistant bacteria more closely, more rapidly, so that you don't then keep prescribing that antibiotic that has already a developed resistance profile in the community. Reducing the inappropriate use of antibiotics in animals, which is a really Really interesting problem in Australia certainly and I'm sure in other parts of the world as well the agricultural and livestock practices involve using antibiotics into the feed for pigs and cows and animals because a lot of antibiotics can be used to promote growth more meat means the farmer can make more money on the sale of the animal to supermarkets having antibiotics fed into your food every single day is going to make any bacteria still living on those animals superbugs almost by default 